Hello and welcome to Mostly Vintage Cameras. I'm afraid it's been a little while since I've made a video. Outside of YouTube I do have a, what you would call a real job and the summer months are the busiest period for me. So I uh, do apologise that uh, I haven't published for a little while now. However, today we have uh, something a little bit different, perhaps even a little bit special. It's the Kodak Retina Automatic 2. Now Kodak as a company are most closely associated with the United States as a manufacturer. But if we look carefully on the badge here, we can see that this particular Kodak is made in Germany. And of course, whilst originally set up in America, um, Kodak is in truth a transnational or international company with manufacturing all over the world, uh, including in this case Kodak AG in Germany. Now of course, German manufactured goods have a reputation for being uh, high quality, high spec and dare I say high priced, uh, whereas Kodak cameras generally seem to be aimed more at the uh, high day and holiday casual photographer at a, let's say, keen price point and a modest specification. So will this Retina Automatic 2 fall into the German premium quality camp or the uh, Kodak, I don't want to say cheap and cheerful, that would be unfair, but uh, consumer orientated product range? Let's find out. And as usual, let's start with batteries. There aren't any. As you can see on the front here, we have a selenium cell light meter. That is a Gosson light meter. Uh, and that doesn't require batteries to work. Now I have to confess on this particular one, the exposure meter does seem a little erratic. And selenium cell meters are prone to degradation over time. But moving on from the Gosson meter, we can see on the front here we have a Schneider Krasnack and I do apologise for the pronunciation, a 45mm 2.8 lens, and you can just see under the lens here it says Compor, that's the shutter. Now Gossen, Schneider Krasniak, and Compor are all good names to have on your camera. They're all high quality. Uh, Gossen's a Japanese manufacturer, the other two being famous German manufacturers. So this camera was um, made in 1960, it was on sale between 1960 and 1963, and was the middle camera in a range of three Retina automatics. I'll tell you now that it was quite an expensive camera. Uh, the Retina range started at around about £55, which uh, was a lot of money in 1960, quite clearly. It would be the equivalent today of going and buying something like a Nikon Z5 or a Canon R, Five, I guess that sort of month salary type camera and it was aimed just like the modern day R5 or Z5 is aimed at uh, the enthusiast keen photographer so were the retina cameras and they were advertised as making it possible for an enthusiast photographer to take good transparency photographs color transparency or slide film photographs getting the exposure right on those slow emulsions in the 1960s was rather more demanding than it is today. But let's go ahead and take a look at some of the controls. Uh, as is common with all the cameras of this sort of period, most of the action happens on the lens barrel. Focus, uh, the red numbers are in feet, the black numbers are in meters. And we can see we've got these little dots here, three, two, one. And these are for portrait, half length, and what you might call mid distance or full length portraits. The three dots also appear in the viewfinder as a bright line indicator. Now the next control is the shutter speed. We do have a bulb setting, so if you want to do long exposures at night, that sort of thing, you can use the bulb setting. And we also have on the top plate a cable release socket to facilitate that without getting camera shake. The shutter speed range manually, however, is from a 30th to a 500th in full stops, which is a pretty decent range of camera of this age. Now, the more exciting dial on this is going to be the aperture dial. As we can see, we've got a 2.8mm 
uh, I do beg your pardon, a 2.8 aperture lens that stops all the way down to 22. But wait a moment, what's this? We've got a red A for automatic setting. So that means that I can choose my shutter speed and the camera will choose a complementary aperture. Now, film winding is on the base plate, which is a little bit unusual. Film winding also uh, cocks the shutter. The shutter button is on the side here, which is a little bit unusual as well. The number of times when I was using this, and I went to press the shutter button on the top, and of course it's not there, it's down here. In the automatic mode, if it's too dark, the shutter won't fire. But of course we can take it off automatic for the purpose of demonstration and the shutter works fine. So if you do have one of these and the uh, selenium exposure cell has um, given up the ghost you can still use it manually which is quite nice and unlike some cameras that are primarily automatic because we have a proper shutter speed selector and a proper aperture dial, manual exposure is perfectly possible. Also on the front of the camera, we've got uh, a socket for an electronic flash unit. Uh, it's synchronised for flash at all speeds, so you can use a 500th of a second with the flash, which is quite nice. And because we have an exposure cell with automatic metering, we have on the base plate uh, or on the, the lens barrel, I beg your pardon, uh, a means of adjusting the ISO. It's a little bit fiddly, you have to press this silver tag in here and then turn this ring and there's a red dot that lines up with the required ASA value, or ISO in, in modern times. The range, as you can see, is from 10 ISO or ASA to, curiously, 1250. And that was a uh, remarkably optimistic ISO range, or ISO range for 1960. Um, I can't think there would be much film of, of the higher values there. 400, 800, 1200 ISO. Seems unlikely. There were, however, films coming in from other parts of the world, which didn't use the American Standards Association calibration, I should say. So there is the Deutsche International number on the base as well. So if you were using uh, AGFA uh, CT18 or whatever AGFA were making at the time, uh, you could set the DIN number if uh, that was your preferred way of doing things. So let's see what else we have here. That's pretty much the front of the camera. The top plate uh, is uh, standard fare, a little bit... Uh, Usually in one or two cases. This is uh, an exposure meter because the meter on this one is playing up a little bit. I can't really show you how that works, but in manual exposure, if you set the shutter speed and it will give you a recommended aperture. We've got the frame counter here. It doesn't automatically reset, so when you open the camera back on a modern or more modern camera, it will spring back to zero. On this one, you need to use this little slider control and you push this button in and you slide this control and hopefully you'll be able to see it's moving the uh, frame counter back round to zero uh, a shoe on the top plate so if you've got your flash plugged in the front cable will go off and the, the flash unit could uh, sit there for you um, you could use other accessories on there if you had a rangefinder uh, for focusing. It was quite a common accessory to have a, an external rangefinder, a coincidence image device. Um, and actually focusing is one of the things I did struggle with with this camera because it doesn't have any means of indicating correct focus. So a rangefinder might not be a bad choice. So the last thing on the top plate is a little memo, we've seen this sort of thing before. So there's a tiny, tiny little black dot. I'm trying to find it. It's currently here next to this uh, chrome and black uh, arrow. So that's indicating I've got black and white film loaded. 
and if I, it's really quite fiddly, press this little ring and twist it with a bit of effort. A bit more. There we go. I can move the little black dot into the uh, third of the dial for colour film. And you'll see I've got colour tungsten or light bulb balanced and colour daylight with the, the sunny symbol there. So uh, depending whether you had uh, tungsten balance film or uh, daylight balance film, of course. So that's pretty much the top plate controls. Strap lugs on the side. Uh, opening the camera back on this is also a little bit fiddly, but it's uh, designed not to be opened by accident. You move this over, and I'll do it from this side, to reveal this little press dot here. You press to press that in, and the camera back opens. This is all uh, pressed steel, I presume. Uh, and there's a nice overhang, a nice lip on the film back, which engages on the camera body. So there's really very little chance of light leak on this camera. There's not even any felt down the side here. So light leak protection is purely through the fit and finish of the camera, which is pretty cool. Should point out at this point maybe it's got a very nice leatherette finish to it as well. So film loading is standard fare. If you're loading a camera like this or any manual wind camera that has automatic exposure, it's usually a good idea to take the exposure off the automatic setting. So we take our film, you see there's some little knurls here. We can move the take up spool around till we reveal the uh, slot to put the film leader in. And we just stick the film leader in there. Pop this up. There we go. I'm not sure if it's the uh, precision machining of a German made camera or just uh, a slightly fiddly old design but everything fits at the exact angle so you have to get the film cassette exactly flush to close it so I'm going to turn the rewind crank in the direction of the arrow just a little bit to take up the slack in the film and then when I take the next blank shot I can see that rotate and that confirms the film's moving through the camera correctly. I then go off, take my photographs. The wind on lever on the base plate actually caught me out a few times as well. A um, number of times I went to reach up to here to wind on and of course there is no wind on lever there. Um, so we're pretty much getting towards the end of the controls on this. Little standard quarter inch um, tripod mount to rewind the film. Press the rewind release button in and turn the rewind crank in the direction of the arrow until there's no more resistance. There we go. And then we can take our film mount. I should uh, point out, as always, I'm operating this from behind the camera, um, which makes it a little bit difficult for me to see quite what I'm doing. So that's the Retina Automatic 2. Um, as I say, it was a, a camera intended at the enthusiast, serious photographer um, part of the market. And if we turn to my British Photography Almanac from 1961, uh, I don't have a 1960 version. We can open this up. Kodak, uh, along with a number of other manufacturers, take massive adverts in these uh, almanacs. And at the bottom here we see the Kodak Retina Automatic 1. That's the sort of uh, basic version in the range. There's a 2 and a 3. 
Outstanding fully automatic 35mm camera equipped with a 45mm Schneider Riomar lens. That's interesting, it's a different uh, lens on the Mark II, probably a slightly better one. Uh, and the Protomat S shutter. Again on the Mark II we've got a Compor shutter, so again slightly better spec on the Mark II. Uh, built an exposure meter, automatically adjust lens, aperture and shutter speed to best possible combination. So again, difference between the Mark I and the Mark II. This is uh, setting the shutter speed and the aperture, uh, whereas the Mark II is giving a little bit more control over the depth of field, or more accurately over the shutter speed. Um, so perhaps a little bit more enthusiast orientated the Mark II over the Mark I. Best possible combination of subject in view. Uh, if insufficient light, shutter speed cannot be depressed. That's true across the Mark II as well. If you go to take a picture and it's not bright enough, it'll say stop in the viewfinder. And I'll try and show you that in a moment. Uh, the above is one of the a wide range of Retina and Retinet camera made at the Kodak Precision Camera Factory at Stuttgart. So Kodak really underlining the fact that this was from their um, German manufacturing base rather than the uh, more common uh, American one. Now, as I mentioned, I did take a few photographs of this. Um, and as I mentioned, I did struggle a little bit uh, with some of the images. So uh, starting with some general mid and far distance uh, landscape images. None of these are particularly exciting as is always the way. It was a super sunny day uh, and this first shot was shot against the, uh, uh, the, the light, quite a lot of sky and you'll see that uh, whilst the detail is pretty good you do lose a little bit of detail in the in the leaves and the fine twigs against the sky and that just shows the difference between a, a 1960s lens and a modern lens with modern lens coatings where you'd retain a little bit more of that contrajour detail in, in the uh, twigs and that sort of thing. Uh, the next image um, showing that with a 45mm lens if you buy a modern 1980s or 1990s single lens compact like a Nikon AF3 for example, typically has a 35 or a 38mm lens. The 45mm on the Retina just gives you a slightly shallower depth of field, so you can just um, throw the background out a little bit more than perhaps you could with uh, a later compact camera. Uh, and I think this image is, is probably my favourite of the role of the film. Um, moving on again, a bit more sky, we're seeing little bit of lens flare, but still uh, a nice uh, overall image. Uh, and we can see that running through the next couple of frames as well. Now when it comes to the near distance focusing, this is something I, I struggled with um, quite a bit. Uh, and we can see on this next image that uh, the focusing, well, to be blunt, it's wrong. I got it wrong. Simple as that. Uh, the next image as well is another fail. Uh, and as time got on, I, I got slightly better at uh, guessing the near distance focus. That slightly shallower depth of field of the 45mm that's so useful at throwing the background out of focus. Obviously, the flip side of that coin is you need to be a little bit more accurate with the nearer focused images um, and then as we work through these various images uh, I did try uh, a couple of uh, I suppose you call them more advanced techniques and intentional camera movement which um, is just a blurred picture in reality now the last image here is a train uh, it was near a, a mainline train and I would have bet money that train was further forward than it is when I pressed the shutter button. So I'm not quite sure, as I went to press the shutter, 
at which point the shutter actually opens on the movement of the, the shutter release button. But nonetheless, those are some photographs from it. Pretty good, pretty nice. Um, a later camera would give you a little more contrast in the highlights and a little less, um, or a little more detail perhaps I should say, against a bright background. But overall it's quite capable of producing some very nice images. Should you buy one today? It's difficult to know how much they would sell for. I could imagine a retailer that specialised in sort of used film cameras could ask as much as £100 for one. But at the same time I could imagine you could pick one up in a charity shop or uh, perhaps on eBay from a private seller for as little as £5. So it really depends on condition, on if that selenium cell light meter is working and how much you like the camera. For me, when I look at cameras like the Olympus Trip 35, this seems to be a much better value proposition, if only because you can truly use it in manual exposure, which of course the Trip doesn't really have. I know a lot of people say you can use the flash setting, but it does have two shutter speeds and you can't choose between them. Uh, so, yeah. If you want the 1960s vintage vibe, with a good quality lens that's maybe a little bit more, for want of a better expression, a nifty 50 or nearer to a nifty 50 than you'd get on uh, something like a Trip 35, then um, yeah, this could be a good choice. On the other hand, if you are not as good at focusing like me, uh, particularly at the near distances, um, maybe a later Canon Sure Shot AF3 type camera is also worth considering. It really depends on what you're looking for in your vintage camera experience. But I enjoyed using it. This is, actually isn't my camera. I borrowed it from a colleague uh, to whom I'm grateful. It belonged to one of his, um, I dare say at this stage, elderly relatives. They bought it from new. So they would have spent quite a lot of money on this and hopefully they enjoyed it. Anyway, that's been the Kodak Retina Automatic 2. Thank you so much for watching this video. I do hope you've enjoyed it, or at least found it of use. Do have a good day.